Thank you for joining today's web conference, EMRS Studio Application. My name is Colin, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we begin, please note that due to the number of participants attending the event today, the phone and voiceover IP lines will be muted during the session to minimize background noise and to ensure that everyone can clearly hear the presenters. You are welcome to submit written questions today. If you've connected via the web application, please use the notes feature in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and address your notes to all moderators. Or if you join via the participant application, you can go to the participants tab at the top of your screen and then select send note to all presenters. There will also be an opportunity for verbal Q&A today, at which point I'll give you instructions on how you can ask a question over the phone lines. And lastly, if at any time you experience technical difficulties, please feel free to send a note to me. And that would be the ATT CES operator. And with that, I would now like to formally begin today's conference and introduce Liz Clark. Good morning, everybody. I'm Liz Clark. I'm a training specialist at uh, Plum Island Animal Disease Center with the Professional Development Services Branch. And I'm really pleased to be hosting this webinar today on the new emrs to go application. Our speaker today is Dr. Brian Archer. Dr. Archer received a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from Kansas State University in 1997 and received a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Kansas State in 1999. He has worked for USDA, APHIS, Veterinary Services since 1997 in various locations as a field veterinary medical officer. Nationally, Dr. Archer has been extensively involved in a number of animal disease emergencies, including low-path AI, BSE response, exotic Newcastle, as well as avian influenza surveillance in Washington State. He was also detailed to the HPAI 2015-2016 serving in California, Washington State, Kansas, and Minnesota. He serves as a member of one of the USDA five national incident management teams. And currently, Dr. Archer is an emergency management response system staff specialist with USDA APHIS, VF, Surveillance, Preparedness, and Response Services, National Preparedness and Incident Coordination. Dr. Archer serves primarily to support EMRS use in Districts 4 and 5 and provides incident support nationwide. I'll now turn the webinar over to Dr. Archer. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for spending a little bit of your Thursday morning with me to learn about our, our new emrs to go mobile app. Um, the way the presentation is going to work this morning is I'm going to go a little bit through a PowerPoint, and then I'm going to leave the PowerPoint about midway and, and jump into the application itself and show you how, you, how a field operator, field operator excuse me, would complete it and then upload the information into EMRS. Um, basically, what the new emrs to go mobile application does is it provides a very easy, very simple way for somebody in the field to directly input information and then upload that into EMRS without any further data entry required. Um, it's been tested in, in the field and has worked very well in places such as the New World School Board Institute screw worm incident and um, was greatly valued by the field staff there once they had it as well as the, the IMT that was helping them. Um, we've used it in a few other applications and it's gone very, very well and we're very excited for its, for its release hopefully in the not too distant future. As far as our side goes on the EMRS team, we have the EMRS to go mobile application finished and ready for release. Um, but we are currently waiting on permission from our IT group uh, to finish their review and then allow us to release it. So, so like I said, we're kind of ready to go. We're just waiting for our permission to release it, and I'm uh, not sure when that will happen just yet. It's kind of out of our control, um, but we're anxiously awaiting that, that permission. So with that, I'm going to jump right into the mobile application uh, presentation, and we'll go through it, like I said, a little bit, then we'll jump into the app itself, and I'll show you how it can be completed in the field. What this application is going to do is it will allow FADBs and others, such as AHTs or, or other field investigators doing door-to-door -door surveillance during an HPAI event or whatever, but they'll be able to use the application to enter information for a full animal disease investigation or whatever the situation may be. Information is collected and entered directly into a tablet, a laptop, or a PC that has the app downloaded. It must be on a Windows-based system, so the Apple iOS is, is not supported. Um, but on any Windows-based system, it can be done. Information can be entered offline without any Internet-type connection, and then once the user has access to Internet, they can then upload that information later in the day um, into the system. Therefore, it does not require any duplicate data entry. Basically, the user enters the information as they go, and then once they're ready to upload it, it shoots it into the system, and the system further processes it into all the various forms within the MRS. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. 
FADD then can use that contact report to add information to their field investigation, but other forms, such as epidemiology reports, DS-123s, et cetera, can be added as future enhancements occur. So for those states that are using EMRS currently to track things such as EIA lab inspections, um, we hope as a future enhancement to be able to add inspections for garbage feeding, EIA, those types of tasks right on the same application. They can then be further uploaded without any further data entry at all. This application will also create forms for the user, such as a completed 10-4. So once the FADD enters all the information for an FAD investigation, at the end they can click this little button called the Forms button, select the 10-4 and have a pre-printed, I'm sorry, a pre-completed 10-4 ready, form ready for them right there. And I'll show you that as we go through this. You can also attach additional files. So if the investigator takes pictures um, or, or grabs scan copies, PDFs of user records, or draws a pen map, or whatever, um, those can also be attached to the form and uploaded into the system. And then once it is uploaded, the ICR can easily, and in some cases automatically, be converted to a premises, an animal business, an investigation, a completed exam, and a submitted laboratory submission, all automatically without any further data entry. Um, you know, kind of the knock in the past on EMRS was the data, data management or the data entry aspect of it and how intensive that was. And admittedly, in the earlier versions of the MRS, it was very data entry intensive. What we're tracking to and what we're doing, particularly with this app, is removing data entry steps and requirements. So once this form is completed and uploaded, if, you, if the user enters a solid address, for example, that does not exist in the system, when you push it up to EMRS, the EMRS will automatically ping the allocator grab a PREM ID, automatically create the PREM, the business, the investigation, exam is completed, all the clinical observations the user saw, as well as a lab submission where the status is submitted, and enter all the, all the specimens associated with that lab submission. Then, all the DRO or epidemiologist or whoever is watching over the FAD investigation in the office needs to do is wait for those results to come in, and then, you know, put the proper status on the investigation and close it out. So we greatly decrease the amount of data entry that will be required um, based on the use of this application. The ERS to go mobile app does require EMRS access to upload, of course. Users can complete the initial contact report offline as stated, but in order to send that information up into the system, federal and state users must have been granted EMRS access, and that requires the completion of an APHIS Form 513. And those of you that currently have access to EMRS already know what I talk about, what I'm talking about, but that 513 requires the approval of the state veterinarian if you're a state employee, as well as the AD uh, for the area in which you're working. The system does require EOP Level 2 credentials, and it requires the completion of the information security awareness training um, that federal users complete on AdLearn and state users can complete via paper documentation. So you complete that ISA training, and then you submit a 513 to an EMS network associate for processing, and you process it through and then be granted access. Once that 513 is processed, the user receives an email from the VS Help Desk notifying them of their EMS access approval. And you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a few minutes when I actually get into the system or when I show you the PowerPoint a little bit. And you'll recognize the login screen for EOS for EMRS to go mobile app. It's the exact same as what you'll see when you log into EMRS today. So how do you access this Go Mobile? Well, like I said, we have it ready for release on our end. We're just waiting for permission to push it out. Once we push it out, what the users, the FADD to begin with, will receive is an email with, a down, with download instructions. And they'll download the application to their computer. When they download the application to their computer, the icon you see there on the, on the screen will pop up on your desktop. And once it's downloaded, you're going to see it, and you just double-click it to open the app. Now, the question we're going to get right off the bat is, do I have to have administrative rights to be able to put that app on there? And I asked that question of Randy Munger, and he informed me that, nope, it will be allowed to come right in with all of your, all of your other federal programs right on, your, on the federal machines. State machines will just be downloadable right to their machines once that permission, like I said, is granted and approved from our IT security group. In addition to that, as we add further enhancements to the application, such as other forms and that kind of thing, um, you know, in the past, people would have to delete the current application and download the new one. Well, this one is designed that automatic pushes of updates will come, so you won't have to delete. It will automatically update it as enhancements occur. 
So when you double click that icon, what you see on your screen now is what pops up and it's basically called your briefcase and this is where the forms you've completed will be housed. Initially it will be blank because there's nothing in your briefcase so you'll be looking at a white sheet and that's all there is to it. Notice up there in the upper left there's three lines, three white bars. That is the menu button in the new Microsoft CRM applications. You'll be using that menu button to add different things and to perform different tasks which I'll show you here in just a minute. The second arrow that you see there across the top shows you that currently the, the ICR, I'm sorry, the EMRS to Go mobile application is targeting EMRS 200, which is our current training site that we're practicing in for the new version of EMRS. It will be important for the user to pay attention to that. You don't need to worry about it too much today. There will be further instructions that will be provided. But that tells you where your information is going to go. When we release this app and you first download it, it will be pointed towards production or the live side of EMRS. If you want to practice and send it to the training side of EMRS, you'll have to change where it's being targeted, where the information is going to go. And our network associates can help you with that, but that's outside of the scope of this. I just wanted to point it out today. And then notice that plus button down in the bottom right-hand corner. That is simply how you add new forms to your briefcase, and you'll have the opportunity to see that in very much detail here in just a couple minutes. The first time the user downloads the application, they're going to need to load a little bit of information into the application. So for this part, you're required to have, obviously, Internet access to pull some information out of the MRS. So you'll click that little menu button in the upper left-hand corner, and when you do that, this little window pops open and you only have four options. It's very, very simple. You'll see the briefcase takes you back to the home page or main page, if you will. A send button, obviously, for once you have a contact report that's ready to go up a receive button, and then a settings button. The settings button is used simply if you have a tablet or a computer that is GPS enabled. There's a button on the app you can push that will automatically pull the coordinates in for you. you. Use that setting button to set your port correctly. But again, we won't, just, we won't discuss that today. But the first thing that users want to need to do is, is receive some information out of the system before they ever go out in the field. So we click that little receive button. And when you do, this page shows up. You don't really need to know what all these little sections are about, other than at the top there's an option for a new and updated records only to synchronize or a full synchronization. The first time the user uses the app, they're going to want to do a full synchronization prior to going out in the field. And what this does is it pulls some information out of EMRS and loads it into your application. And I'll be able to show you this a little bit better later, but for example, when I select that I'm in the, working in the state of Kansas as my incident site, and then I select an investigator on the next list of drop downs, by selecting Kansas, the next drop-down then limits itself to only those investigators in Kansas. And then alternatively, if I move to Oklahoma to assist them with something, and I change my incident site to Oklahoma, when I select the, select the drop-down for investigators, the only investigators I'll see are those that are currently in Oklahoma. So you have to pre-populate that type of information into the app first. And that's what we're doing here. But again, you only do that once on your full synchronization, and then periodically from time to time after that, you'll just want to refresh with new and updated information. So you select what you want to do, the full or new, and then you select the little download button that's down there in the bottom corner where it says number two. When you do that, as I already mentioned, you need to have access to EMRS to pull some information down, and you need an Internet connection for this step. It's going to ask you for your credentials. So you'll select EOF, and then if you're a a uh, federal user and you have your PIV card entered, you'll, you'll obviously select to enter in your PIV credentials. If you're a state user, you'll enter your user ID and password, click log in, and move on. This little window pops up. It lets you know that you're about to download some information from EMRS, and this may take a while. In reality, it only takes, even for a full synchronization, it's less than three minutes. I've done it several times, and it goes very, very quick. When you're doing the new and updated records only, it, it oftentimes less than a minute, it goes very fast. You just select OK, and then you're looking at your at your um, receive screen, and you see where all those green check marks are. Initially, those are blue circles, arrows in a circle form, and then as they become downloaded, you just see all these green arrows start to populate down there as success it has been downloaded. And then it tells you reference data is complete. You just click OK. You click the menu button at the top, and you go back to your briefcase. And again, this is just what you do initially to get started. Now you're ready to go out in the field and, and do the FAD investigations or door-to-door -door surveillance for, for high-path AI surveillance or whatever the incident may be. 
At this point, I'm going to go ahead and leave the PowerPoint and go into the application itself just to show you how easy it is to fill it out and then how you can access the 10 and upload different things and that kind of thing. But I do want you to know that this PowerPoint does go on and it shows step-by-step -step instructions as all the things I'm going to demo for you live in the actual application. And this PowerPoint is going to be made available in the EMRS and the training materials um, as well as some other training documents for EMRS to go that we'll discuss at the end of the, end of the presentation. So bear with me just a minute. I'm going to leave this PowerPoint. And I'm going to go right into the DeGo application. So you should all be looking now at my briefcase. And you'll notice here at the bottom of my screen, there is, and I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but you can see down there at the bottom of my screen a little briefcase. That is my EMS to go app. And that's what will be on the user's desktop. So they will double click that that application, I'm sorry, that yeah, that application icon. And when you do, this is what opens up. And initially it's empty. There's nothing in your briefcase. And as I've already mentioned, you have the menu icon in the upper left, and you have that plus button to add forms to the briefcase in the bottom right. I'm going to go ahead and click on the menu icon and show you those four little options we discussed already. And then just so you know, first time you ever use it, you must have internet access and EMRS access. You click receive. And here we go. If I want to do full synchronization, I'd select it, and then I'd select the download arrow, and away we would go. Everything that you see queued there would become a blue circle, and then as they're downloaded, it would be a green check. You just need to wait for that to complete. It would take about three to four minutes. Once it's done, I just go back here to my briefcase. Now my app is loaded, and I'm ready to go do work in the field. From this point on, I no longer need Internet access. So I'm now out in the field, and I've received information to do an FAD investigation in Kansas. And we're going to, so I'm going to enter data for a fictitious FAD investigation that I've been called out on to do. So how am I going to go forward with doing that? Well, I just double-click my icon, open up my briefcase, select the plus button, and I get the option. Which, which of the following options do I want to do? Obviously, right now, there's just one, and that's our contact report for field investigations. And as I mentioned earlier in the PowerPoint, um, in the future, we're going to have such things such as tasks for entering EI lab inspections, garbage feeding inspections, um, VS 123s, those types of things as future enhancements occur. But as stated, we just have the one option, so I'm going to open up my contact report. And the form opens up. Now it's very, very simple to go forward. And, and the reason you had to do that initial receive and download of information is that 99% of the fields you're going to see in the next several pages are drop downs to allow for quick and easy data entry as well as consistency. Well, you had to load those drop down or lookup options onto your machine. And so again, that's why that reference data had to be loaded first. But you see the very first option we have is what incident and it's required field. Why are you doing this investigation? So you select the drop down and you see our current instance that we have in EMRS that you might be working in. Obviously, for this one, I've already indicated that we're going to be doing an FAD investigation, a fictitious investigation here for this presentation. So I'm going to select FAD. What is the reason? Obviously, for FAD investigations, these are usually complaints. So I'm going to select complaint. And what is my investigation type? What is the primary reason that I'm out there? I'm going to say that this one was a vesicular skin of muslin feet FAD investigation that I'm being called out on. What is my initial, initial classification? A lot of times when you're initially going out, it's undetermined. You're not sure. But if you have a high suspicion, intermediate, or low from the start, you can enter that here. And then, of course, we always, for FAD investigations, have to enter an FAD referral control number. So I'm just going to make one up and enter it in. What's my exam reason? Is this a follow-up or a sick call? Obviously, on FAD investigations, initially, they're a sick call. And what's my source? Diagnostic lab, practitioner, producer, or some other source. We'll say that a practitioner called this in. The state defaults to Kansas for me because the MRS remembers a little bit once you've been in the system and it'll start to pre-populate some of these for you, but you can always change them. But it defaulted to Kansas since I've used it before. So I'm going to go ahead and select Kansas. Now note that when I selected Kansas, I can select an investigator, and these investigators that are listed are people that are in the state of Kansas. If I change my state to Kentucky, now the only investigators I see are people that are in Kentucky. Again, part of the preloading that you did before you left. So I'm going to go back to Kansas. 
And we're going to assign Dr. Cody Garten to do this work. State visited obviously is required. You can manually enter it, but it must be in a specific format. So the user can just select a little icon over here on the right-hand side and select the date. It will highlight today's date for you because we want to get to the communities in real time, of course. So I'm going to select today's date. Which type of visit? Obviously, again, for FAD investigations, these are usually an initial visit. So if we're doing backyard surveillance for HPI or whatever, it may be a second round visit or for backyard or third round visit or whatever the case may be. But I'm going to select initial here. Oops, excuse me. Now, quarantine date and quarantine number. These two are not required fields. But if I put a quarantine on the premises, I can go ahead and enter that and put in the quarantine number. And that's important because when we upload this in the EMRS, if I complete these two fields, the system will automatically put a quarantine status on the premises, I'm sorry, on the investigation in EMRS when it's uploaded. I'm going to go ahead and leave these two blank for now. When you have the fields completed, you just click the arrow to go to the next section of the ICR. If you know the premises ID, you can enter it here. And when I click outside of this line then, the rest of this page is pretty much going to be filled in for me. It will put in the prim name, the address, the coordinates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For an FAD investigation on an initial visit, usually you don't know the prim ID, and that's perfectly okay. So I'm going to pretend like this is a normal FAD, and I don't. this premises does not have a prim ID. We've never visited it before. So prim name. I'm going to name this Brian Archer's Ranch. We could type any type of print description that we would like to here. Uh, if it's a commercial operation, you know, or, or whatever it may be. And this is just a field where you can type whatever you'd like. This is not a drop-down field. You're limited to about 100 characters on this field, so it's designed to be summary. Select prim type. You just, you'll recognize these, those of you that get into EMRS, it's the same options you have on the, on the business page in EMRS. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say that this is um, other. Physical address, put in the address. Five hundred East North Yav in the person Kansas, instant site. Is Kansas and the print state is Kansas and the zip code of course is required and must be entered. Now this is where we need to have a, just take a break and just talk a little bit about these addresses. We need to really get in the habit of talking to our field staff and ensuring that they enter an accurate address for the location in which they're doing the investigation. And the reason for that is if we have a solid address when it goes up into EMRS and it pings the allocator and it's a good solid address it will further process and create all those forms I mentioned before. It will create a PRIM, it will create a business, the investigation, the exam, the lab sub, et cetera. If there's not a good address or there's a misspelling in the address or whatever it may be, it will still go up in the MRS and will basically be parked as an ICR and require the epidemiologist or the DRO or whoever the coordinator is, and that may be the FADB, to then go in, fix the address or, or fix the correction or request an exception or whatever, and then further process it manually, which again isn't a big deal, it's a couple clicks. But if we ensure we have a good solid address here that's a 911 based address for where the investigation is being conducted, um, it will go through without any further data entry or further processing required. When you scroll on down, you see the Use GPS button. Again, this is what I was getting to on that Settings button we saw on the initial menu. Um, if you set it, if, you're, if your machine, your tablet, whatever is equipped with GPS and you set it to the right port, you can just click this button and your prim latitude and longitude will automatically pop in there um, based on your machine's capabilities. If you don't have it, that's okay. You can use a handheld GPS unit or your phone or whatever to grab your coordinates and just hand enter them right here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And then, of course, you have the option of entering driving directions if you need them or if you have them. And I'm just going to type something in here just to show you where you get lost. Okay, So you can enter in some directions into the page. So now we've captured just a little bit about the prim. We go to the next page. Now we're ready to capture information about the animals. Are susceptible species for the incident selected found on the prim? Obviously, for an FAD investigation, we're being called out. The answer is yes. 
But if we're doing backyard door-to-door -door surveillance and we selected HPAI 2017 as our estimate at the start, and we're knocking on doors and there's no birds present, we can select no and then move on and we're basically done with the form. That's very important when we're doing backyard surveillance because, you know, when you're trying to determine how many susceptible species are in, in an area for epidemiological reasons, this type of information is, is valid and important and we can also easily put it up on a map. Um, so you'd select no and move on and, and we'd be done. But in our case for this example, obviously it's yes, there's going to be susceptible species. And so now you see additional fields pop up for you to complete. What are the estimated number of species? I'm going to say that I've got 35. I'm not a backyard producer. This is a cow-calf operation. My primary species group, obviously, then, is going to be bovine. And now, are there clinical signs present? Yes or no? And again, this is important for doing backyard surveillance. If there are birds present, for example, but there's no clinical signs present, we click no, and we bang through, and we're basically done with the form unless we collected samples. But obviously here there are clinical signs or else we wouldn't have been called out. So now we have a couple additional fields to complete. Well, what's the most prevalent clinical sign? And in this one we're going to say that blisters or vesicles is the most prevalent sign. That's the reason why it was called out. What's the estimated onset? We'll say that the practitioner called us today, this morning. We don't really have any other information about onset. Chance to enter further explanation of clinical signs. So we can say that Dr. Joe Vett contacted me this morning to report vesicular lesions in a HEPA. We examined for a health certificate she is headed to a show this weekend. Okay. You can type as much as you want for the lines that are allowed. I mean, I say as much as you want. I think it's limited to 500 characters right now, um, but we are going to work on getting that a little bit longer, so you can type a, a novel if you want here. But right now, it's limited to about 500 characters. So you've got the information initially. You just hit next. Here's your prim contact. Brian Archer is the guy's name. Put in his phone number. And if you have an email, you can enter it in as well. Move on to the next piece. We'll do a mortality census. You see a little lab button up here in the upper right. You can click on it. Species, when you click on it for a drop down, cattle comes up to the top because that was my primary species already selected. I'm going to say there's one sick, none dead, 34 unaffected. And then we'll also add another group because we've got some 4-H uh, pigs on the prem. I'm going to come down here and select a different species. Fine, zero sick, zero dead, and I've got four of them, four gilts there for my kids for 4-H. If I had sheep, goats, whatever else, horses, I could continue to add additional species. What's my primary disease differential that I'm worried about? Just put in mouth disease, and I think this is unlikely, okay? So now, you know, you can enter your confidence now, you can enter it later as we go through and start entering clinical science here in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and move on. And I can now look at samples that were collected. So I can come back here and add a sample now. Initially it's blank, but I want to add my first sample. Select my subject type on my drop down. Is this an individually identified animal, animals without ID, groups of animals that are identified by lot or whatever, or just groups of animals? Obviously, for this one, I'm looking at an individual heifer, so she's going to be individually identified. What's my identifier? I'll put in her ear tag number. And then what is that identifier type? Is it an official ear tag, a tattoo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I'm going to select official ear tag. If we were doing something like backyard chickens, my primary identifier may be backyard chickens. And my identifier type then would be name, you know, if they weren't identified or whatever it may be. Specimen identifiers. These are our specimen numbers, our sample numbers that are on our tubes. I'm going to enter in a barcode number. I'm going to go ahead and enter in four of them. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, five. One, two, three, six. And AO, one, two, three, seven. For this first one, AO, one, two, three, four, we'll say that this is serum. The second one, we're going to say that we've got EDTA. 
and the third one we'll say is heparin. And this last one here we're going to say is an oral swab. Now again, species, cattle's going to come up to the top because we had selected that earlier. My breed, now I'm limited to just my cattle breeds. I'm going to select Angus. She is a female. We'll say that she is a two-year-old heifer. So I just put in age of two, select years as my age qualifier. What is her current condition? Clinical. Okay. Subject description. So I say two-year-old heifer, two centimeter by one centimeter, using on the tongue. I was able to pull foxtail arms from the wound. The wound is in process of healing. So there were some five and tags or some whatever you want to say around the edge of it. Now I've got my first sample ready to go almost. I've got to enter in the number of the group that I sampled for this particular sample. There's only one in this group, and I sampled that one animal. So if this was backyard chickens, and there were 10, and I only sampled five of them, then obviously the number of group would be 10, number sampled would be five for this particular sample. So here it's one for one. Clinical onset, after looking at it, I think this has been going on for a while. After talking to the owner, he first noticed something going on a couple of days ago. I'm going to go ahead and back it up a little bit, but I'm unsure. What's my clinical sign? These look more like erosions to me than they do blisters or vesicles, so I enter in the clinical signs. If I had additional clinical signs of the three for this animal, I could go ahead and select them and enter them in here. When I'm done, I can just hit save. And here's our information for the sample I just collected. If I had additional animal, animals I sampled, I would simply collect the add sample button and continue to add them. If I decided I entered something incorrectly here and needed to go back and edit it or delete this sample because I just screwed up, I could just hit the little ellipses button here, and I have the option to edit it, to come back in and edit the form and open it. When I'm done editing, I can just hit save. Or if I decided I screwed up and I want to get rid of it, I could just delete it, which obviously I'm not going to do. So I'd add the samples I needed to add, and now I'm ready to move on. Future enhancements, by the way, right now when you add sample, you don't have the option to copy the previous information. That would be very, very helpful. And so that is coming um, in the near term, the ability to just copy samples and change uh, the ID of the animal. If you want to go to the next page, now I've got my lab submission information. So I can come in here and select the lab I'm shipping to. So we're going to say that I'm shipping these to Saddle, but you'll notice that all the non-labs are in here as well. That's my submission date. I'm shipping them off today. Submission reason. This is obviously an FAD, EDI type investigation, so that's the reason for this submission. Who is the submitter? When you downloaded that information to start out of EMRS, provided they had a contact record in EMRS, all you need to do is hit Copy Investigator, and it brings them right in for you. If they're not in EMRS currently, that's okay. You can still manually enter in the information. So if you handed this off to a, an AHT or somebody else, and, and they're just driving it up to the lab, and it's a non lab type sample, you can just hand in there if you like. And enter in the submitter's phone information. Now we get down to the shipping information. So what's the air bill number and the shipping method? So they are FedExed off. What's your priority? One, two, or three. Our disease for screening number one is foot and mouth disease. You can select additional diseases as we would like. So we can type in PhD, blue tongue, whatever it may be. Okay, and enter in your additional disease options. What's your preservation in your pack? None, chemical ice, wet ice, whatever it may be. Well, obviously 99% of the time is chemical ice pack. And then if you had any submission comments that you wanted to add. And so you could say three blood samples, one oral swab, and TV, TV media, or whatever you wanted to do. Now we go next. Now we get back to the review piece. And if there were any required fields in each one of those pages I went through that were not completed, I would have a red exclamation point here telling me I've got something I need to have in there that's required for it to go up. 
but obviously I've completed these all okay. But one thing that we wanted to look at was the fact that I've done my investigation, I know there's foxtail on, and I didn't really put that in a disease differential, and that'd be kind of critical. So if I wanted to go back to any one of these forms and add information, I can. I can come right back to this mobility and mortality census, which is where that information was housed, and go directly to it. So here's where I have my primary differential in foot and mouth, and I do think that's unlikely, but my secondary, I think, is trauma. Oops, sorry, trauma. Because I did find those foxtail arms in the wound, and that's what I think the problem is. So I can add information quickly. Go through back to the end, and here I go. Now for the FABBs on the call, I don't want you to miss this last section. This is the overall comment, so you can enter in your diagnostic impression and what you think um, about, about the investigation and what's going on, what your priority was, what your reasoning was, and that type of thing, and you can enter it here. This is the place to do that. So you can enter in some overall comments. It said this is priority three. I noted foxtail arms in the lesion as well as the feed and examined. Okay. Did not place a quarantine on the premises. Anticipate results prior to the to the owner leaving for the show. I have notified the SAHO and A B of my diagnostic impressions, and then you could add, if, you know, if you happen to have some trace information you wanted to add, or if you had biosecurity recommendations for the owner and everything you discussed with him or her and what you told him, that kind of thing, you could type it here and, and put it in. So that way you've captured your diagnostic impression. Now it's simply hitting the Save button. And now you'll notice our briefcase has a form in it, and so we're good to go. This one's complete and ready to upload into EMRS. Just about. We want to take a few other steps here in a minute. But pretend with me for a minute we were doing HPAI surveillance, we were doing door to door. This could be for one house. You know, we sampled chickens, we filled out the exact same forms I just showed you. We now go knock on the next door. And all we need to do is hit the plus button, open up a new contact report, and we're ready to go. Except for we would select high path AI and fill it out for a high path AI investigation if we're doing door to door backyard surveillance or whatever. I'm not going to complete one for that purpose, just wanted to kind of give you an idea. So at the end of the day, you may have a list of 10 or 16 or whatever different forms here. You can also, when you're filling out those forms, if you knock on a door and nobody's home and you need to come back, you can get it started and put it in as the address you're at and that kind of thing, and then just leave the required fields blank, um, and then come back to them the next day and see if you can catch somebody at a different time. Hit the Edit button that you see here to open that form up, and then continue to complete the form once you catch somebody at home. But we're going to move on now. What I want to do is show you how we can create a completed 10-4 out of the information that was just put in the application. So you click on the Forms button, and you can see we have two forms in here. One is a generic avian influenza specimen submission form. The other, obviously, is a BS-10-4. So sticking with our FAB investigation, we're going to select that BS-10-4. This form opens up within your application, and you'll notice as I scroll through it, and much of the information is already complete. So Dr. Garden's name is submitted in here, his email address, his phone number, the name of the owner of the, of the, of the premises, Brian Archer, I'm with Pershing, Kansas. Third block size is completed. The reason for the purpose of submission as well as the examinations requested, okay, are auto-filled auto for you. Who collected it, the date collected. You can see the information that was entered into that form has been added, okay. We get down here to the bottom, the sample ID and barcode IDs are put in, as well as the breed, age, and sex. Now, there are many fields on here, however, that were not entered directly in the form that are required to be or should be on the 10-4, such as the mailing address for the submitter and that kind of thing, as well as their ID. So I'm going to go ahead and put in Dr. Garton's address. Okay. I'm going to make up a submitter ID form. If I know the county of the individual here where I did that investigation, I can enter it in. If I knew a premises ID, I would have hopefully entered it in the app, 
Um, and it would have carried over to this box four right here, but I didn't, so that's okay. I'm going to move that blank for now. Who authorized it? Dr. Don Evans, AD of Kansas and Nebraska. Come on down to the rest of the form, and I can enter in any additional data I feel relevant. And now I'm ready to go. So once I've got the form completed, I can, I'm ready to save it and move on. So here's what's really neat about this. These fields that I just completed, the mailing address, the submitter ID, the, the authorized by, all that stuff is going gonna, is gonna to automatically save in the background. So next time I come in here and I open up this 10-4, the fields that are completed in the app are going to be populated just as you saw when I first opened it, and the fields I just now completed are going to be remembered and they're going to be auto-saved in here. I can always edit them and change them, but I'm not going to have to fill those out again. I only have to fill them out the first time. Now that I've got my form ready, I do need to save it, however. So I'm going to export it as a PDF by clicking the button here at the top. I'll save it on my hard drive. Using a standardized naming convention. That is the trend name, underscore the form, underscore the date. And when I save it to my hard drive of my computer or my tablet, I now have a VS 10-4 that is completed and filled out, and all that I need to do is print it and throw it in my shipping box. So um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but there are at in Fort Collins, Dr. Randy Munger is the one that, that oversees them and is responsible for keeping them updated. And we have 38 tablets, tough book tablets, ready to go with this application on it. And with each one of those, he sends out a Bluetooth printer. And it's a really cool little printer. It's, it's very it's only a couple inches wide by about 11 inches long, a couple two by two by 11, I think, or something like that. Um, don't require any wires or anything. They're battery powered. And so sitting right there in your print truck, you can just file print this to that printer, load a piece of paper into it, and you immediately have your 10 floor printed right there in your truck. So all you got to do is sign it, fill it in the box. So now that this is completed and done, I need to go back to my briefcase. Hit the option, come back to my briefcase. Now I'm right back here to my form. If I took digital photographs or whatever the situation may be, if I have additional uh, documents the producer gave me and I scanned them or used an app on my phone and took a picture of them to convert them to a PDF or whatever and, and just moved them over onto, onto this tablet or whatever it may be, and I wanted to attach those to this, all you got to do is click the attachments button. And notice that that 10-4 I created is already attached. So that 10-4 is going to automatically go into, up into EMRS for me, and I'm not going to have to do anything else with it. If I wanted to add additional pictures or PDFs or whatever, all I've got to do is click the plus button, navigate to those items on my computer. And I've got a picture here. Just, this is just a picture of a turkey, so just play with me. Uh, that it's additional lesions, picture of the lesion or whatever. But you just select it off your hard drive and you can attach it. You name it whatever you want it to be named and, and there it is. And you can add as many attachments as you would like. Now when I just click outside the box, it goes away. When I come back to my attachments, I see the two attachments that are associated with this contact report and it's ready to go up. Now I've got everything done and I'm ready to upload this thing into the MRS. Now keep in mind, everything I just did was done offline. I did not need any type of internet connection whatsoever to do this. So now, and that includes creating that 10-4 and being able to print it if I had access to a printer, whether that be a Bluetooth printer in my truck or, or I had to go find an actual printer somewhere. But now that I'm ready to upload into EMRS, now I have to have Internet connection. So if the investigator is driving back home and they swing into a McDonald's or a Starbucks or somebody that has free Wi-Fi, um, they can upload at that point, or most of us now have hotspots on our phone where we can just upload. Okay, where you can hook into your phone and upload that way. So when you're ready to upload a document into the system, you come back here to your main menu, and now we're going to use the Send button. When you select Send, this form and all the other forms you may have created are going to be checkmarked. So let's say, for example, that I visited five prims, ten prims on a street, and a few of the people are at home and I need to come back, but I went ahead and created a form to capture the address to know where I needed to go back to. All I would need to do is unselect those, and they're not going to be uploaded. They're going to stay on my tablet or on my laptop. But for this example, I've got the one, and I do want to submit it up. So I select the checkmark button. You've got this little paper 
airplane icon down at the bottom that indicates you want to send. I'm going to send it. Now, as we've already mentioned, I have to have permission in EMRS to upload information into the system or to pull information down, and it's the same access that you have to already have to access EMRS regular today on the website. So it's going to ask me for my EOF. I'm going to select EOF. It's going to ask for my PIV. If I was a state user, I'd put in my user and my password. Enter my PIV information. Select OK. Once it verifies that I have permission to access EMRS, it's going to start to upload that investigation, and here it goes. Oh, and I had, a, I had an issue, and it's because of the building I'm in and my Wi-Fi is not quite working very well. So don't worry about that. But it disappears and goes on up into the system, and away we go. And now it's ready for further processing in EMRS. I've been testing this extensively lately, and I've had as many as 20 different PRIMs, um, 20 different ICRs loaded onto the app, onto the app and some of them quite extensive. Several of them were backyard surveillance from nobody's home, but some of them were like, well, I did an EIA deal where I had to bleed 12 horses and I had samples from all the horses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and even when I had as many as 20 prams, it uploaded within 60 seconds, all of them, very quickly within the system. So that's basically it. It is very, very simple to use, and it can um, be done very, very quickly. So when I come back to my briefcase, once you get the hand hang of it and entering these in, those drop downs, a uh, field investigator can go through it quite fast, fill out the information and upload. And again, when I hit that send button and it disappears and it all goes into EMRS, provided I've entered in a good address, okay, EMRS will automatically create a premises business investigation exam, completed exam, complete with the samples, I'm sorry, complete with the clinical observations, as well as a lab submission complete with the specimens. If I put on a quarantine, it will create a quarantine status, as well as the animals or animal groups I, I sampled, it will put them in as animals or animal groups on the business, and it will create the morbidity mortality census based on the animals I entered um, very, very quickly and very, very easily. So we've basically taken the data entry, put it in drop downs in this application in a very easy to complete form, and allowed it to go up into the system, just boom, 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 uh, automatically after that. So the next question is, as far as training, how do you get additional training for your field staff on how to do this? Well, I really think that once they have the option, uh, the ability to do it once or twice, you're going to see that it's not that hard. It's pretty simple. But I'm in Fort Collins this week, and we're working with our EMS Network Associates here, and they were all given this PowerPoint presentation yesterday, as well as some other training documents, as well as had the opportunity to actually use the tablet and to fill out the, the, the contact form I just showed you themselves. They're now equipped to go back out and go back home, and you're more than welcome to reach out to them for face-to-face -face trainings or additional webinar-based training or Skype-based trainings to show you how to do it. In addition to that, at the conclusion of this call, I'll go load into EMRS and the training materials. I'll create a folder called EMRS to go. Actually, I think I'll put it under the Disease Management Toolkit, and I'll attach both this uh, PowerPoint I showed you earlier as well as a couple other training documents, so you will see those there as well. One thing I want to be sure to get across is a lot of folks seem to have it in their mind that they have to do this on a tablet because we have these, you know, 2038 tablets or whatever here in Fort Collins we ship out to use in the field during an incident. You do not have to have a tablet to do this. I just showed you the entire application using my laptop, and it works very, very well on a laptop. Um, and, and so you don't have to have a tablet to do it, that's what I'm trying to say. And, in fact, the tablet works great. But if you're typing some comments and those types of things for your overall diagnostic impressions, quite frankly, it's easier to use a little laptop that's got a keyboard on it. And so as we move forward, I kind of hope that we kind of transition to this idea of using these two-in-one type laptop, uh, tablet type uh, things that are out there to allow a user to put, snap a keyboard on real quick if they want and type or, or whatever it may be. Um, but you can use tablets today. The other question I get all the time are phones. You know, can I do this on my phone? And right now, the capability is not there to do it on a phone. Um, that may come in the future. But as you saw, there's a lot of fields to fill out here and that kind of thing. And I think personally, on a tiny little phone screen, that would kind of be a pain. Uh, so I think, in my opinion, a tablet or a laptop type modality is going to be the best option. Um, so keep that in mind. And past that, just be looking in the future when we get permission to release this thing, 
um, FADDs uh, will get probably through the ADs and state vets um, a download link. Like I mentioned at the start, you just download the application to your computer or your tablet. And like I said, when ICON will show up, you're ready to go. You'll open it up. You'll have an internet connection. You'll first do a receive to download the background data, and then you're ready to go. And with that, I'm pretty much done with my presentation, and I'm ready to answer any questions. All right. Just a quick reminder for those online, if you've connected via the web application, you can type in a question by using the notes feature on the bottom right corner of your screen. Or if you've joined via the participant application, you can go to participants at the top of your screen and then select send note to all presenters. And to ask your question over the phone line, you can do so by pressing pound two, and you will be notified once your line is unmuted. Okay, we have some written questions, Brian. Um, let's run through those first. Um, someone wrote in, can you split samples and send to two different laboratories easily? That is a great question, and we've received that a lot. The answer right now is no. There's not an easy way to do it to have them both created. Now, there is obviously a quick workaround. Um, you can create your 10-4 and then go back in and change the information in the app. Use the edit button for the other lab, the null lab or the, FA, or the uh, battle lab, whichever it may be. Um, and then just go right back in and hit forms and now print off a separate one um, for the null lab. But obviously, since you updated the form, the ICR, the initial contact report, only one lab submission is going to be uploaded in the EMRS. So you'd have to manually go in and create that second lab submission under the exam, um, whereas just like you would today. Um, but it still saves you a lot of entry from having to enter in the first one. You only have to enter in one now instead of two. Now, for future enhancement, I talked to Dr. Bourgeois about this yesterday, and he's already thinking along these lines, as you can imagine. Um, but he's, he's gotten in his works in his mind how he can build and develop um, a copy function to be able to do an additional lab and have it go through. Um, so we have to start somewhere, and this is where we're starting with, with one lab initially. Um, but two labs is coming, um, but right now, for the first release, that piece will not be there. Okay, another question is, does this application uh, run on MS-DOS programs? Uh, I don't, it's a Microsoft-based application, um, much more than that, you're outside of my wheelhouse. I'd have to defer that to Andy Munger um, at Fort Collins, um, so somebody, you can email me, remind me, um, send me an email who's asking that question, and I'll be happy to find out the answer to that to you. But I, I, I don't know how the thing is built. I'm just I'm a user and I'm a tester, so I'd have to defer to somebody else with more knowledge than I. Okay. The next question is: Will the barcode labels generated on the 104 form be able to be printed also to attach to the samples? That's a great question. Um, possibly for a future enhancement, but right now the way that's being envisioned and designed is that you get the barcode stickers, you know, the rolls that we've been able to get in different kits and that kind of thing. Um, and you just put your stickers on your tubes and you enter in the barcode number that you put um, as your sample ID. It, 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 the ability right now is not to enter, hand enter those barcode numbers and, and create stickers and print stickers is what I'm trying to say. You use existing barcodes that you have. Okay, and the other question was when the ERS to go app is available, it's going to be available for laptops, and then the question is, how would you request the application? You would go through your, um, your AD. Um, we will receive all FADDs. Or I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how Randy's going to push it out just yet. My my expectation is that he'll push it out to the ADs and the state vets, and they'll be then asked to forward the link on to their FADDs um, that are doing FAD investigations. Now, obviously, we have many FADDs that work in NIS and those types of things that may not use the application on a day-to-day -day basis and may not need it unless there's an incident or an outbreak. Um, so initially, I think the release is just going to be pushed out to those that have the need to do it. But when we get into situations where we're doing backyard door-to-door -door and those types of things, um, then we can just make the access available um, to that download at that time. But as I said, that's all kind of being held up right now because our IT security is, is determining um, the best way to handle those types of things, and so we're just waiting, waiting on permission to release. The initial release, I believe, and just the, the bulk email that's going to go out for the download is probably just going to go out to um, FADD diagnosticians uh, currently in the field doing FAD investigations today, probably coordinated through ADs and state vets, but that's yet to be determined. I think we have one verbal question, Colin. Yes, going out to our first caller. Please go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, Brian, this is Lewis Dodds in North Carolina. Um, you talked about you know using it on laptops, obviously, uh, and it is Microsoft based. Um, you know, and for responses and things that doesn't create an issue, but but the applications you mentioned, such as FADDs or uh, inspections down the road, as those things come on, you know, most of us in the field don't carry our laptop with us. So you know, we're we're in order for us to make use of it, we're, it's going to have to be on a tablet of some sort. And over the last couple of years, that movement from IT has been toward uh, Apple-based equipment, you know, I, I, obviously iPhones, but also the iPads that we've been issued. Um, is there any look at, at trying to, to revise this or, or adapt it down the road for use on iPads or maybe some discussion with the IT people to try to get everybody on the same page so that they could look at potentially some Microsoft-based tablets. Again, I'm, I'm, we've had those in the past. It was an epic fail, so they went away from those. But, uh, you know, just curious about, I mean, the enhancements and the revisions for data entry are, are great, but, you know, if we, if we can't use it out in the field just because we don't have it with us, it's, you know, not going to be as useful. Thanks. Right. So, hi, Lewis. Uh, first of all, it's good to hear from you. Um, second, yeah. yeah, that's a great question, and, and, and let me address that just a little bit. The reason it's working on a Microsoft platform is that we use Microsoft CRM for the EMRS platform. It talks very, very well together um, going back and forth. And, and, and a lot of folks don't realize this, but Microsoft CRM is an off-the-shelf product that Fred has, has tailored for animal disease-specific emergencies and response. And the reality is that, you know, Microsoft CRM is used by Best Buy and Polaris and Barclays and all these major companies, and it's got a lot of capabilities to it. And so there's a lot of reasons why uh, Microsoft CRM is a great one to use because it's, it's going to be around, it's going to stay around, it gets a lot of support um, and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we use Microsoft CRM. As far as working on the iOS application, um, according to Dr. Munger, the answer to that is no. It will not. It will not work with the iOS application because it is a Microsoft-based application. Um, and then, so that then moves into your next piece about you know using laptops in the field or not using laptops in the field. My personal, and this is just Brian Archer speaking, so this is my own little soapbox, and there's no official uh, weight behind it at all. So my personal hope and and push is that we will start to transition our field into the current century and start to move towards things, and you know, just maybe like a Surface Pro tablet or some of these Samsung tablets or whatever that work as two-in-one, laptops as well as keyboards, where they can plug in the big monitors at home. Um, you can have a nice size keyboard at home, and then if you go out in the field, you can just snap that thing off, take it with you, as well as a portable keyboard that snaps onto it if you want. And we can start to, you know, join the current century and entering data um, and information that we need to collect um, in a mobile type platform. And in fact, that is the entire reason, and one of the major reasons um, for the new look of EMRS here in just a few days, hopefully, when we're moving from our current standard version of 2011 to 2016. And you'll notice that some of the buttons have moved. Mainly, it's a navigation thing. People are going to have to just get used to. But the idea with the whole Microsoft 2016 uh, applications and the, and the new look is so that people can do things on touch screens um, wherever they're standing. And so I, you're right um, that you know currently it may be a little bit difficult for folks to take things out in the field such as their laptop. Um, but the reality is some people do it all the time. And, and a lot of the FAD investigators I know now <laughs> take their laptops with them um, and do do some complete in the field, and a bunch don't. You know, so I think that's just going to be something that is going to change over time, particularly as we start to think towards more mobility for our field staff and the type of tools and equipment they need in the field. What we've done with this Go Mobile application is even if you decide to fill out your FAD investigation on, on a big chief tablet and a number two pencil um, in the field, when you come back into your office, you can still now quickly and easily use these drop downs to get that information in and upload it into EMRS without it taking you much time at all as well as generated 10-4 if you want it. And then the application is sitting there ready to go as soon as, as our IT department starts giving us the equipment to where we can easily, quickly do it in the field with such things as a tablet. The reality is, if you want to use your computer today to do it in the field, you can. You just unplug your laptop, take it with you, 
um, fill it out, put it there in your truck, um, and away you go. So if it were me and I were an FADD, and I hope I don't make any ADs fans because I know money is always tight, but, you know, one of the things to start thinking about is what are these little blue teeth printers? And is this something we can start to think about and, and maybe getting prepared for? As far as those, and I never had one of those tablets that they put out in the past. Was, I think they were called venues or something like that. And I did hear some pluses and minuses about those things. Um, it does work on those. Uh, this current app will work on those venue tablets. Um, but there may be some better options out there. Um, and I think well, there are some better options out there, too. So I think that's more of a hardware problem, to be honest, than it is a software problem with the Go app. With the Go app's ready to go. We just um, need to use the hardware that, that you want to use to now utilize the application. All right, we have a couple more written questions. Um, the first one is, once you upload a report into EMRS, if the premise address you entered is similar to, but not exactly the same as an existing one, does EMRS potentially create a duplicate record? Great question. So let's say I put in an address that already exists in EMRS, and I just did not know the PREM ID. When it gets auto-uploaded, EMRS is going to look for that, and if it finds the exact same address, it will go ahead and create a new investigation, uh, not a new business. It will ping it to see if the current business exists, and if it does, I'm going to just use that one and create an investigation and see if the current investigation exists. If it doesn't, it will just use that one. Create, see if an exam exists. If it doesn't, it will it'll create a new one and it will just use that one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it pings off that address. And if it finds one that exactly matches, it will go ahead and use it and use what's existing in the system. If there's not what existing what it needs, it will go ahead and create a new form. Um, with that being said, if the address is not the same and does not match perfectly, and the answer is no. It holds up as an ICR, initial contact report, in EMRS. So it gets uploaded, and then it's parked there. And so part of the trainings we're going to be doing for our DROs and EPIs is how to look for those and, and see where they are, and then further process them and manually kick them on. Because EMRS does not, we do not, with the, using this application, want to create duplicates. And we have several safeguards created to prevent that from occurring. So since an address wasn't perfect or it would not validate, that requires some human intervention to now further process it. Okay, and the last one I have, I think you might have answered it. It said you mentioned if there's a bad premise address in the contact report, it will get parked in EMRS and require follow-up. How does the app and EMRS make sure it's not allocating duplicate slash new NPINSs if the address is good but not entered exactly the same as what EMRS has for that existing premise? Well, we all use, you know, we all use that same national allocator. And so our national PREM IDs are based off of those USPS 911 addresses out of the national allocator. So that's our standard that we're paying off of. Um, so I, mean, I, I think I kind of touched on that a little bit ago and what I just said a few minutes ago, so I may have already answered that. Um, but if it, if it doesn't ping out of the allocator, then it's going to park it. Okay. Do we have any verbal questions or written questions? Written questions are done for now. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? At the moment, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. Okay. Well, we're at the little bit over the top of the hour. Um, I think we'll just go ahead. There's other, if there's other questions, please, uh, you can forward those questions to Brian or to myself. We're both in the APIS book. Um, and I just want to thank everybody. Um, we had a grand total of, I think, about 288 people on here today, so that was great. Um, we do have another webinar coming up on Thursday, September 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Dr. Ken Takashida from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, he'll be presenting on biosecurity and combined poultry, uh, materials and publications, elements of biosecurity self-assessment developed at CDFA. And his 25 years' experience as a poultry veterinary practitioner will be used for the basis of this webinar. Um, the sign-in information for that webinar will be sent in the near future, and hope you can join us for that. And with that, I will bid you all to have a great afternoon, and thanks again for joining. All right. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody in the audience, for joining us. This concludes the call. You may now disconnect.